the story of the Denver Broncos Football Club is infused with colorful characters, unforgettable comebacks, unwavering support, and most importantly, a winning tradition. Throughout the franchise's first 24 seasons, the goal was simple, to give the Mile High City a hometown team it could be proud of each and every Sunday. It wasn't until 1984, when Pat Bowen purchased the team, that that goal morphed into a mentality, and the Denver Broncos were expected to be the best at everything they did, both on and off the field. In the 1970s and early 80s, as the Broncos toiled in the AFC West, one of the most important figures in their future was developing his own passion for success far away from the Rocky Mountains of Denver. Michael Edward Shanahan developed an interest in the game of football at an early age. I was really influenced throughout my career with my high school coaches and college coaches. But I, I think that one time that I decided that I wanted to coach, I lost my kin kidney playing football in spring ball my junior year. And after you lose your kidney, you can't play anymore. So I knew I wanted to get into coaching. And so my mindset was, hey, if you're going to get into coaching, uh, you might as well do it now. Whatever your expertise is, is if it's a wide receiver or a running backs or a quarterback coach, you know, what you do is learn not only that area of responsibility, you know, and inside and out, but then you have to study defenses as well. So it's part of the growing process. And, and when I did make my moves in college, every move was kind of a, a chance to be maybe the quarterback coach or be the coordinator. With each job that I took at the collegiate, collegiate level, there was more opportunity to run the offense, put your own system in. So it was a great opportunity for me to call plays before I got to the NFL. He was an assistant. He was the coordinator at the University of Florida. They had a quarterback named Wayne Peace. And every quarterback in the country is completing 57% of his passes, a little more, a little less. Florida is completing 72, 74% of their passes. And I remember saying, what is Florida doing different? What is it? The answer, of course, was, was their offensive coordinator, Mike Shanahan. I got a call from uh, Dan Reeves and asked me to come out and interview for the uh, wide receiver job. And he said he was actually looking for a wide receiver coach and possible quarterback coach because Dan was going to work with the quarterbacks as well. And I had just been to Philly and uh, I was offered the job. So I was thinking that I was probably going to go to Philly at that time, not knowing that I was going to get this interview at uh, Denver, but with John Elway off of his rookie year and having a chance to coach the quarterbacks after the interview, uh, Dan had offered me the job and I said, what a great opportunity for me. I remember from a personal standpoint, Mike picking me up at the airport when I was traded from the Browns to the Broncos. And uh, I did not know who he was. And he introduced himself. He said, I'm, uh, I'm the wide receiver coach, Mike Shanahan. Well, I tell you the first time I met Mike, I mean, you could tell right away, he was a young guru. Uh, he was very highly thought of coming out of college. Very polite, very nice, polite guy. You know, he was an assistant coach and he did not try to act like he was any more than that, but he was very uh, special. And actually you could tell right away that he had it. And that's a very difficult thing to pinpoint, but I generally look for it on the coaching staff. And sometimes you don't find one, sometimes you find more than one. And in that case, Mike Shanahan had it. When I first came to Denver in 84, I came here with a guy named Alex Gibbs. And he's, uh, he was at Auburn. He was at uh, Georgia when I was at the University of Florida. And I always enjoyed his running scheme, the zone scheme. And so when we came here the same year in 84, we started implementing a different type of running game. And that was when we first introduced it. And then from that time on, you know, we just, uh, it just grows. And it, become, it became part of our philosophy and different things we believed in. And there's a lot of branches that carry over, but. I think the reason why the zone scheme got so much success back then, we were really one of the few teams or only teams that were really running it to that extent. I first met Mike uh, when John and I were playing in Denver, Elway and I were playing in Denver, and um, Coach Reeves hired Mike uh, that off season to come in and coach our quarterbacks. He comes in with a big reputation coming out of uh, college football and steps into pro football and into our room 
but very competitive, uh, very fiery, uh, very smart, uh, but very driven. You, I mean, you could see from the start that this guy was going to have a great career because of his passion for the game and his, his drive to be great. The work ethic that Mike had and plus the knowledge he had of the game of football that, uh, you know, it, we had an instant friendship and instant respect on my behalf as of, uh, you know, him as a football coach and, and how he could help me and make me a better football player. And he did that. But one of my first jobs was getting to know John and they wanted him to really get involved in the offseason program, weightlifting and all the things that, you know, football players do. So I got to know John right away by being in the weight room. Uh, him working out every day, doing things that he really had never done before. And it was fun for me at the same time. And the reason why I bring that up is Pat was really a triathlete. He loved to run, he loved to work out. And so he'd be in there every day. So as I got a chance to know John, Pat was in there, you know, two, three hours a day, either doing, going on his bike or going for runs. And so that was a great opportunity for me at that time to get to know Pat. And so when I did come back here as a head coach, it was pretty easy to have a, a conversation with them about what we needed to do, or at least what I thought we needed to do to kind of get to the next level. Coming up on Four Quarters with the Denver Broncos. Pat was there right on the brink, and what he wanted to do is do things that maybe gave us a chance to get over the hump. Before Mike Shanahan began his 14-year tenure as head coach in Denver, the Broncos had been to the playoffs 10 times and won four conference titles, but they had failed to achieve the ultimate goal of becoming world champions. Well, I've said earlier that, uh, you know, if they told me ahead of time that you can win the AFC championship and you're going to lose the Super Bowl, I'd just say, let me lose the AFC championship then because uh, it's too much of an emotional uh, 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 letdown uh, for me and for my players and my coaches to, to go out there and lose. You know, it's a very t tough thing to put behind you. Pat was there right on the brink, and what he wanted to do is do things that maybe gave us a chance to get over the hump. And I think he saw me being in San Francisco for a three-year time frame and finally having a chance to win it, that maybe we could bring some of that, you know, uh, expertise over to, uh, uh, to Denver. San Francisco had the victory party after winning the Super Bowl, and Pat put on uh, like a leather jacket, a baseball cap pulled down over his eyes, sunglasses, had a contract in his back pocket. And he comes up to Mike and he's Mike. And he, Mike, like, he said, no, it's me, it's Pat, it's Pat, Pat, hello. And he said, I got a contract right here. I want you as my head coach. Yeah, you know, the, the 49ers was, was the team that was talked about, you know, amongst the league. They had a high-powered offense. It was very innovative. And so to bring that and sprinkle it in here with a bunch of guys who were all blue-collar over here in Denver, and to bring that other element and the professionalism. That's one thing I love is the we literally went from, if you want to call it, we went to basically to first class. Everything we did changed. You know, Mike had the opportunity to stay where he was, which was in San Francisco, which was obviously a very, very good job. He had the opportunity to take other head coaching jobs, and he chose Denver. That makes me very proud, makes me very proud of this city, makes me very proud of my team, to know that Shanahan's coming here to coach it. Mike Shanahan will have full control of football operations. That's what I want him to do. So it's, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce the new head coach of the Denver Broncos, Mike Shanahan. When you first start, you're not really sure what you do have until you go through your first year. And so, you know, you have an idea, you know, what type of scheme you want to use, but until you see those players actually practice them, what type of character they have, you're really not really sure what direction you're going to go. And so the first one was kind of an 8-8 season, and we were kind of so-so on both sides of the ball. And then after we found out who our players were, what guys we could count on, at least we felt we could count on at that time, uh, then we could kind of start getting players that fit within our scheme on both sides of the ball. One of Mike's major assets was he wasn't afraid to change during a game and could go ahead and they could see things and make sure that if, if they were do, doing certain things defensively and we had a chance to take advantage of it, he would do everything he could to take advantage of it. And I think that that's what made him such a great offensive coach is his ability to change on a dime. Before Mike got there, we hoped to win. If we did this right, if we did that right, Maybe if the other team had an off day, we could win. With Mike, we were expected to win. We expected to play well. 
and it was very disappointing when we did not win. People were like, had to adjust to us all the time. We never adjusted to them. We would put different personnel in. We could put three tight ends in the game, and you'd think we were going to run the ball. And next thing you know, we'd throw the ball five times in a row. So we kept defenses, especially on offense, we kept defenses on their toes. And I think he really gave our defensive coordinators and, and all those guys the leeway to call the blitzes and things that we need uh, to, to make sure that we had a balance as a team. Anytime you have like 10 Pro Bowl players one year, another year you have like nine, there's a reason because you're working as a team. And one of the reasons they get that recognition is because on how they've played as a group. The number one thing I learned from Mike or watched from Mike, I watched him come into Denver as a very successful football coach. There was a lot of good players there. John Elway, Shannon Sharp, Gary Zimmerman, a lot of, a lot of good football players in place. But I watched Mike take a group of men and make them a team and uh, teach them how to go win a championship. That's what I was most impressed in watching him doing the job he did. You can stand up and salute in Denver, and you got the world champions that live in your town. In 1996, the Denver Broncos put the National Football League on notice after going 13-3 in the regular season and securing the number one seed in the AFC playoffs. While Denver was the overwhelming favorite to go the distance that year, when the Jaguars pulled off the upset in the divisional round, Shanahan and his Broncos were forced to dig deeper. After we lost the Jacksonville game, he told me, he said, Jim, I gave him the wrong goal. I told them have the best record in the AFC. So they had the best record. So we had home field, home field advantage. But by having the best record, they had achieved the goal that I set. We weren't running the ball, we weren't very physical. Um, and at that time, the teams we were going against were more physical than we were, especially when we got into the playoffs with Jacksonville. So it was a lesson for me at that time that maybe you're gonna have to do things a little differently if you get put in the same situation. And that next year, we kind of took advantage of it. So the next year he said, our goal, because we are good enough, is to win the Super Bowl. Division champion, wild card, best record, not a best record. And uh, I remember we played the Green Bay Packers. We were the biggest underdog to win it since Joe Namath and the Jets. You probably won't be asked this in the next couple of weeks, so I might as well ask you about this 13-game winning streak that the NFC has in the Super Bowl. Well, they have. They've played very hard. Uh, hopefully that uh, we're physical enough on both sides of the football to compete with them. It'll be a great matchup, whoever it is. We're just looking forward to playing. All right, congratulations to you, Michael. See you in San Diego. Thanks, Greg. I think it was so tough because, you know, the AFC had not had any success, and I think it was 13 losses in a row. And so then with the previous Super Bowl losses and not really even being competitive, no one did give us a chance. The AFC has lost 13 consecutive times to the NFC, and the reason perhaps turnovers. NFC 44 to 10. You know, those turnovers just didn't happen. They were caused by the NFC. They've been bigger, stronger, and more physical. They have just out hit the AFC. That's the reason why they've won 13 in a row. I felt so good about our, our, that team, and I knew it was going to be tough because, you know, anytime you get in those playoffs or championship games, but I thought we had the character to win those tight games. And it didn't really surprise me that we did because I was actually expecting it. You know, a lot of people didn't want us to go to the Super Bowl because we've been embarrassed so many times. And of course, our, our team didn't feel that way. But at the same time, you know, the first thing that happens is Green Bay scores a touchdown. The end zone. Back there is Antonio Freeman. Touchdown, Packers! There's only one way you do it where you've got everybody working together. And we had such a great coaching staff and great personnel, which Pat allowed you to go out, not only get the best, but keep the best uh, uh, coaches and players. So it was fun to be able to uh, accomplish something that we were close, but never was able to do. Fourth and six for the 31. Blitz is on, Farm hit as he throws, pass is gonna be incomplete! Denver holds! Denver's gonna win it! You can stand up and salute in Denver. And you got the world champions that live in your town. 
You did it, bud. All you right, did it. Great Love you, man. No way great job. Man. You did it. Oh, you, Anytime you play a team like the Packers, you got to show up and you got to find a way to win, and that's what happened today. I know this is where you felt you should have been a year ago, but I imagine it's been worth the wait. Well, it's not easy. There's a lot of great teams out there and a lot of great organizations. I'm just very proud of this one today. We had a pretty tough, mentally tough football team. That was determined, and we won some tough games and kind of did it the tough way. And I actually think the next year, we, we, were, we were good. For the first time in your career here in Denver, you were shut out of halftime, but you made some remarkable adjustments in the second half. Tell us about it. Well, first of all, we beat a heck of a football team today. Very well coached. They played hard for 60 minutes. Our players stepped up. They made the plays. They're the ones right there. Look at them. Fantastic job, guys. And thank you, fans. Felt good to win that AFC. But what we talked about before, there's one goal we've had from day one, and that's that Super Bowl. Enjoy the win. But we're coming back with one thing in mind, and that's that second ring. Get ready for those Atlanta Falcons, man. They were one of the best defenses in the National Football League at that time, and they actually took away our winning game. And that was their plan. And the guys just, they knew what they were doing. And they gave us a lot of big plays. And, you know, that's where John was at BP and he retired after the game. And, you know, how can you play a much better game than he played uh, in that game and making the big time throws that he made? I'm, I'm sitting there on the sideline and, and all of a sudden Mike comes over and he's got his, his pad and stuff like this. He's, hey, listen, we're gonna call fake eight, uh, 19 quarterback key pass right. Hey, on this particular play, the safety's Eugene's robbing Ed on the crosser. Make sure you run a post. I was like, what? Oh, it's going to be wide open. It is going to be wide open. Red, 2800. Come on. Elway boots and rolls to his right, stops, loads it up, throws down deep the middle of the field. Rod Smith's got it. When him and Coach Kubiak and Coach Heimerdinger and Bobby Turner and these guys get kind of like a think tank, and they, they are very detailed, man, and uh, for a player, uh, you, you you just buy in. You literally just go off faith that whatever they say is going to work, and that's what we did. I've covered football for 40 years. I've never seen a head coach who was so good at calling the exact right play at the exact right time and catch the defense off guard. It feels just as good to last. Oh, I know. It's unbelievable. What a feeling, huh? World change. I'd like to thank my family and my close friends who who, without whose support I would never be here. Four words. This one's for you. My dad's just been such a standard for me. I think it, one thing that took me a while to admit I wanted to get into coaching was just because I watched how hard he worked. There's a lot of times where you have sort of in-depth conversations uh, amongst committee members in terms of a particular candidate. Mike was Mike was a no-brainer. I mean, that, that conversation honestly took about 20 seconds. You know, his name will be up where the other greats find their names, and that's how it should be. Mike's resume is as good, if not better, than some of the coaches already in the Hall of Fame. Mike deserves to be not just in the Ring of Fame, but in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I have great respect for Mike Shanahan, and uh, what a deserving honor to be inducted into the Broncos Ring of Fame. Mike's teams were always prepared to play, always uh, cutting edge uh, on the offensive side. People wanted to know what Mike Shanahan was doing because he was always kind of ahead of the curve. Mike knew what he was, and he knew the kind of person he wanted to hire. And um, Matt LaFleur, Kyle Shanahan, McVeigh, and Anthony Lynn in uh, Los Angeles. These are excellent coaches who were all part of the Mike Shanahan tree. Good coaches feed off other coaches. And so you may give somebody an introduction into something, but they run with it because they got to study the whole off season. They've got to know every detail. I think when you look across this league, you see his offense everywhere. It changed the game. And I use it, the, the LA Rams use it, San Francisco 49ers. I mean, you see it everywhere. So I think he definitely left his mark on this league and left his mark on me. What I learned from Coach Shanahan early on was just establishing a process, a rhythm, and, and having standards with the way that you go about every single day. His work ethic was, was second to none. He, he, was, he would outwork everybody in the building. Um, he never BSed people. Like he's, he shot them straight. That's um, kind of how my dad raised me to do it. That's how he always did it, and I found that's helped me a ton throughout my career. It is a lot of 
pride to watch people have success with what you've done with bits and pieces. But I think you're smart enough to know that they constantly try to take it to the next level. Hey, Rod, we're walking around out there. We're walking around as a team. Tell those guys to get their ass going. He just really made a huge impact on my life. Uh, a lot of the things that he stood for, I still stand for. My dad's just been such a standard for me. I mean, I, I think it, one thing that took me a while to admit I wanted to get into coaching was just because I watched how hard he worked. And I didn't always know if that was possible for myself. I don't know if I ever told Mike this, but one of the great things I learned from Mike was that you could do those things and, and still still be a good dad, still be a good husband, still still find the right, find the time, you know, for those other things in life that are important. If there's one thing that I can look back on, I can say it was fun for me, is really the tough times and the perseverance that you do have, you know, through getting through those things, you know. My saying, oh, you know, tough times never last, tough people do. And to me, I really believe that.